Blacksburg Historic Lecture Series, but lecture may be a bit of a misnomer for what I'm going to do. Uh, when Joanne Pack Sutphin asked me several months ago to do this, uh, to do this thing, whatever we're going to call it, I told her I didn't want to prepare a talk, but if I could just sort of ramble about the uh, diaries, I would do that. So if you would, please regard this as a kind of casual rambling rather than a lecture. I hope that'll be okay. Uh, and interrupt me at any time about uh, anything that uh, strikes your fancy or if I make a mistake that you uh, want to call me out on. Uh, I really thought I'd just start by talking a little bit about Alec Black. Uh, after all, he is the man uh, who, whose house is now becoming the Blacksburg Museum, that house that has been moving around some the last uh, year or two, courtesy of Bob Pack and the town of Blacksburg. The uh, Alexander Black House, of course, was used for a long time as the McCoy Funeral Home, and before that as other funeral homes. But it sat down here on Main Street, and then it was moved back to uh, Draper Road, as you know, beside the Thomas Connor House. Well, Alec Black was my diarist, James Armstead Odie's brother-in-law. Uh, Alec Black married Elizabeth Kent Odie, Lizzie Odie, in 1881, causing great confusion for me some hundred and, what is it, 20 years later? Because he had a sister named Lizzie Black as well. So in the diary, sometimes Lizzie Black is Alec Black's sister, and sometimes Lizzie, Lizzie Black is, is his wife, Lizzie Odie Black. Anyway, Alec Black uh, was the son of Dr. Harvey Black, the legendary Civil War physician, and Mary Irby Kent, and he was the brother of Dr. Kent Black, Charlie White Black, and Elizabeth Arabella Lizzie Black. Alec Black was, I guess, about the biggest thing in Blacksburg in his day. If you went outside Blacksburg, at least a few years before the period in which he reigned supreme in Blacksburg, he might have been rivaled by James Randall Kent, who was maybe the biggest deal in the county. But I think it's fair to say that in his day, Alec Black was kind of the biggest deal in Blacksburg. He uh, had lots of real estate. He owned the uh, Alexander Black Company. <clears throat> Nothing too presumptuous about naming a company for yourself, I guess. Anyway, I was often referred to as the A. Black Company. It was located at 104 Main Street, next door to the bank, to the bank of Blacksburg. The bank of Blacksburg was on the corner. All these places I'm mentioning are right around here, of course. Bank of Blacksburg was on the corner uh, where Capone's now is, across the street from the down, present downtown office of the National Bank of Blacksburg. Uh, Alexander Black owned the A. Black Company, and next door he sort of owned the National Bank of Blacksburg. He uh, established the bank. He was president of the bank for 46 years, uh, which seems phenomenal. But of course he lived during an era of patriarchs who held sway in their particular uh, domains for similar periods of time. This is the same period during which Carol Montgomery Newman was chair or head, as we said in those days, head of the Department of English at VPI from 1916 to 1941. <laughs> Somebody holds that position now five years, we think it's a miracle. Same period of time during which Roy J. Holden was uh, chair or head of the Department of Geology for 38 years. Well, anyway, Alec Black was president of the National Bank of Blacksburg. I, I should say the Bank of Blacksburg, but that became the National Bank of Blacksburg in 1922. He was president of that for, four, for 46 years. He was also the uh, leading light in the Blacksburg Mining and Manufacturing Corporation, which was the main mining outfit around here. And he owned several other businesses, either alone or in partnership with his brothers, Kent and, and Charlie. One of them was a feed and seed store right across the uh, street from us here, you know, where uh, Annie Kay's is now. That was, uh, that was Charlie White Black's feed and seed store, but it was also partially owned by Alec Black. Well, <clears throat> talking about Alec Black is kind of a hook to get to a passage in the diaries that I wanted to read you. <clears throat> now, nobody has to worry about staying awake tonight when I read these passages. They're not so dramatic or so... Uh, riveting that you won't be able to uh, get your, your Z's later this evening. Uh, in fact, uh, part, of, part of the point I'm going to make is that these are not terribly salacious or exciting or dramatic uh, entries. Odie simply wrote down 
what he did every day. And most of what he did every day had to do with farming. If he wasn't farming, he was going into town, not just a casual trip. I mean, going into town was sort of a major thing. He did it many times a week, but I mean, you know, you didn't go in and come back 20, 20 or 30 minutes later. If you went into town, you stayed the day and came home, whether you were doing it in a horse and buggy or on horseback or later with a Model T. But anyway, uh, his entries have to do with uh, farming uh, more than anything else, but also with coming into town to uh, visit professors he knew or the, the tech brass whom he knew. As uh, Terry said, he was on uh, <clears throat> good footing with, uh, especially good footing, cl close friends with three successive VPI presidents, John McLaren McBride, Paul Brandon Berenger, and Joseph D. Eggleston. All three of those men appear many times in, in the diaries. Uh, but anyway, back to the first entry that I was going to read you are uh, several entries together. Just say, why is he reading that? There's nothing exciting. Well, no, there's not anything exciting, but this is just, uh, this, is a, this is a typical, this is a recounting of a typical trip or visit from the farm, Walnut Spring, to the black home. He mentions Alec and Lizzie Black, oh, I would say, every other day. You know, he's constantly speaking of his sister and his brother-in-law, and he goes to see them, uh, not he alone, he and his wife, Julia Magruder Tyler, uh, go together to see the blacks quite often. This is, this is, on this occasion, it's Christmas time, 1911. Sunday, December the 24th, <clears throat> raining. You'll find that nine times out of 10, Odie will give you a weather report as the first thing. He's a farmer, and the most important thing in any day is what, what's the weather like. So quite often, he begins telling you what the weather is. Raining. <clears throat> Morning work done up and the men quiet at home. That's because it's Christmas Eve, they're off. J the men, of course, are the hired hands. Julia and I practiced Christmas songs for Sunday school. About 1 o'clock p.m. it cleared up, so we got ready for our visit into Blacksburg. Did not, stop, did not stop at Sunday school because it was so muddy. We stopped at Alec Black's. I put my horses in Lulu Hogue's barn as, Alex had, as Alec had so little room in his. I helped Lulu fill up the stockings for the kids. Lulu Hogue is, uh, is another sister, my grandmother, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> Louisa, Virginia, Louisa Virginia Kent Clark Odie Hogue, who married John Hampton <laughs> Hogue. Anyway, that's Lulu. And the kids whose Christmas stockings they're filling are the six hoed kids, including my dad. Monday, December the 25th. After a good breakfast at Alex and Lizzie's, we got, up, we got over to see Lulu and children with Christmas things. Alex and Lizzie, Alec and Lizzie had 15 of us to dinner. A nice glass of eggnog before and the best dinner one could imagine. Bill Newton was the only one outside of Alex and Lizzie's family. Julia and I took dinner again at Dr. P.B. Barringer's at 6.30 p.m then drove back to Alex. Tuesday, December the 26th, raining again. We left, home, we left town for home after 11 a.m., did some shopping before leaving, had a quiet, pleasant drive. The roads were muddy, but we took it slow as the weather is warm. Found all well and happy here at home. Cow Cream had a bull calf last night. Julia and I are enjoying a quiet rest after our pleasant time in town. Well, <clears throat> Reading that uh, sets me up for telling you about a letter that I received in response to a letter of my own about uh, four or five years ago when I first started working with the diaries. I had the bright idea that maybe the Library of Virginia would want to publish this book. The Library of Virginia in Richmond doesn't publish a lot of, a lot of uh, things, but when they do, it's something of historical importance in Virginia. And so I sent a letter explaining all about the diaries, and I sent eight or ten excerpts. And the uh, fellow there who was in charge, who is in charge of publications, is named Dr. John Kneebone. And uh, Dr. Kneebone wrote back and he said, while uh, the diaries were interesting and he thought it a worthy project, there was a, a great deal of quotidian detail. And he thought the diaries uh, had, were mostly of local interest. Well, uh, <clears throat> I got up and brushed myself off and decided that he was pretty smart. That. Uh, <clears throat> Indeed, the, li the diaries have a great deal of quotidian detail, and they are very much of local interest. Thank goodness I found the Pocahontas Press, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> was the best qualified press in the world to publish this book, really. Mary Holloman and Bruce Wallace didn't seem to mind the quotidian detail or the 
fact that, it, uh, that the diaries are of local interest. In fact, I think they rather liked both things. Quotidian, you know, I mean pedestrian, kind of, dare I say, boring. Well, this is best not read at one sitting. I'll, let's put it that way. <laughs> However, having said all that, <clears throat> I endeavored to find three or four passages that I could read you that are not quite as uh, burdened with quotidian detail. Uh, these, these are uh, passages, entries that uh, tell about things when they're a little bit different from the ordinary. The first one I'm going to read you uh, is that for May the 16th, 1911. May the 16th, 1911. Big frost this morning. Well, there's your weather report. <clears throat> Men, boys, and cook all drunk this morning. They had a big fishing party last night at Tom's Creek. Work was behind and we didn't have breakfast until after 9 a.m. I finished planting Enslage corn today. I planted a lot of beans in the garden. Alice and Elizabeth have had a happy, busy day. Julia has 52 turkeys. She bought six frying chickens for 20 cents a pound. Well, okay, got a little quotidian detail there at the end. But all the hired hands and even the cook got drunk at a fishing party in Times Creek. Isn't that wonderful? Well, believe me, if you've been, if you started in 1889 and you're now to 1911, and that's the most exciting thing that's happened yet. <laughs> thank your lucky stars for that drunken cook. Her name, by the way, was Lily Lily Price. I probably shouldn't tell that, but if you read the book, you would have you would have learned that anyway. Uh, okay, the next one is. Uh, a bit different, but also somewhat out of the ordinary. Th these are the entries for May 13, 14, May 13 and 14, 1916. <clears throat> Odie and his wife Julia are doing something uh, quite uh, culturally stimulating in this instance. They're going to a Shakespeare festival. Saturday, May the 13th, bright and clear weather. Never fails. We did up all the farm work here at home, then got an auto, picked up Louise Black and Hampton Hogue in Blacksburg, went on to Roanoke, then to Hollands to the pageant in honor of Shakespeare. They said 800 were there in costume and 2,000 and 2, or more to, to see it. We remained to the 7.30 p.m. play and started for home at 9.30 by way of Roanoke. Near Elliston, the back, the back auto axle broke at 11 p.m., so we slept in the car and on the ground until Alec Black's auto came for us. Alec Black was the one you turned to in any emergency, certainly if you were in his family. Kent Apperson and Arthur Gardner came for us. We got to Alex at 4 a.m. and went straight to bed. Kent Apperson is the father of Mary Kent uh, Elliott and Nita Little. Oh, no, they're not here tonight. Anyway, <clears throat> if you know them, Kent Apperson is their dad. Sunday, May the 14th, we're at, we are at Alex and came home in his auto at 10 a.m. Jim Odie Hogue, my dad, brought us and took, and took the auto back to Alec. Kent Apperson came along. We found all going on nicely and quietly, and we looked around the place and fed the fowls. At 3 p.m., I went to bed and slept until supper, blah, 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 yada, yada. But anyway, the Shakespeare Festival. Okay, another one, a bit out of the ordinary. Um, this has to do with uh, one of the most uh, famous, or I should say infamous, events in the history of, of Blacksburg. <clears throat> it rivals, or perhaps even surpasses, the shooting uh, at Nutter's store back in 1948 when uh, John Nutter got a little uh, out of hand and uh, shot up uh, some stuff, including his, uh, his boy Otis, I believe. Well, anyway, that's, that's quite... Uh, quite legendary, legendary event, uh, a tale off told. I still hear people talking about that, the Burger King and places, you know, every year or two, somebody else say, you ever heard about old John Nutter? He's so drunk that day, I tell him, wouldn't harm a fly. <laughs> well, on that day, he harmed more than the fly. But anyway, this one is, uh, this is, this is uh, about another murder. This is an in-town murder, not an out uh, in the country at Tom's Creek murder. This is the Vauder, uh, Heath shooting. Uh, many of you must have heard about that. In uh, March of 1917, uh, Charles Erastus Vauder, Jr., a physics professor at VPI and a prominent citizen, shot and killed Stockton Hammett Heath, a young 
man about town, dandy, and uh, very well connected lad, bit of a lad, as the Brits say. He was a bit too much of a lad, I think. Uh, in the Vauder home, and uh, apparently this shooting has something to do with uh, a romantic liaison between Heath and Mrs. Vauder, the former Rachel Mary Henderson. Apparently, apparently. I don't know that anything about this whole affair, pardon the expression, is known uh, to be an absolute fact other than the fact that Vauder shot Heath and Heath, Heath died. Uh, <clears throat> when I was doing this part of the diary, I went over to Special Collections at Tech and found a whole folder on this uh, Vauder shooting. Uh, lots of it containing newspaper articles from around the state. I mean, editorialists and, and feature writers in the Richmond papers and the Norfolk papers and all over were, were talking about this event. Uh, not so much that a homicide in Blacksburg was all that unusual, though I suppose it was, but the, the fact that the, the uh, perpetrator uh, was a VPI professor. However, most of the articles that I read, the, the editorialists and the writers seemed to be more exercised about the fact that Vauder was apparently drunk than about the fact that he had killed somebody. I mean, they were terribly disturbed about the, uh, the morals of the young students, the young cadets at VPI, since a, a faculty member up here at this uh, college actually drank alcohol. Uh, how do we know that Vauder was drunk that night? Uh, I don't know. That, that was, that's what was said, just as it was said that there was a romantic rendezvous. But I'd always assumed that, uh, you know, my salacious uh, <clears throat> little head at, uh, or head filled with salacious thoughts, I, I'd assumed that they, that, uh, that uh, Mrs. Vauder and Stockton Heath were surprised in the arms of love, you know, in flagrante delicto, I believe is the but that's not true. I mean, the murder took place out in the hallway, sort of equidistant between the, the, the Vauder bedroom and the guest room. Stockton Heath was a guest in the home. He was spending the night quite legitimately. And Professor Vauder was downstairs doing Professor Vauder things, including uh, having a nip or two, I, uh, I assume, uh, and came upstairs and shot Stockton Heath right near the stairwell where he didn't die immediately. I learned this from the diaries. He didn't die. He lingered for several days. You'll be happy to know, however, that the, uh, the couple, the Vauders, did not uh, break up over this affair. Whoever was wrong and whoever did what to whom and with which and why and who shouldn't have done, whatever occurred, whoever shot whose friend or whatever Mrs. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, they forgave each other, apparently, because they were seen the very next day walking about the BPI campus holding hands. They stayed married. Uh, Professor Vauder died 17 years later in a fire in their home in Pennsylvania. His laboratory experiment bl blew up and uh, Mrs. Vauder wrapped him in blankets and hustled him off to the hospital and cared for him, but he died. But anyway, they stayed together. He did give up his post teaching here. Though. Sometimes you may hear uh, Professor Vauder referred to as Colonel Vauder. That's because he was at one time Commandant of Cadets at VPI. So he's sometimes called Colonel Vauder. Well, anyway, Odie refers to, to those events, and one does learn a couple of things that I don't think are known elsewhere, like the exact time of the shooting, if anybody cares. Oh, by the way, in that file over at, uh, at uh, Tech in Special Collections, there's actually a map of the entire Vauder home. You know, you see, you know, <laughs> Vauder bedroom, son's bedroom, daughter bedroom, guest room for Stockton Heath, you know, and stairs and the X where the body lay. All right, well, I'll read several entries here about this event from 1917, <clears throat> only reading the parts, though, that refer to the, the, Heath, uh, the Heath shooting. Oh, I almost forgot. One of the reasons this was such a, a, a notorious case, I think I alluded to this, but I forgot to explain it. Both people were very well connected. Charles Erastus Vauder was the son of the former rector of the BPI Board of Visitors, and Stockton Heath was the nephew of Mrs. James Hogue Tyler, the wife of the governor of Virginia at the turn of the century. And what I deduce, what I infer from the entries here, is that Stockton Heath was taken to Radford to the governor's home, Hallwick, on what is now Tyler Avenue, to attempt to recuperate. He didn't make it, but uh, that's, that's, where he was, that's where he was trying to do it. Okay, March 13, 1917. Stockton Heath Jr. was shot in Professor Vauder's home at 3 a.m. on the 14th. I phoned Governor Tyler and he told me that Stockton Heath was able to talk a little and wanted a toothbrush. Well, that sounds encouraging, but hold on. 
On the 15th, phone call this a.m. that poor Stockton Heath died at 5 a.m. On the 18th, caught the 9 a.m. train for Radford. By the way, that, as often as not, people went from Blacksburg to Radford on the train in these days. I mean, that was a very convenient way to get there. Caught the 9 a.m. train for Radford <clears throat> to Stock Heath's burial. Some others from Blacksburg went too. It was a rough, cold day blowing snow. Can't resist, can you? The lower rooms of the house, Governor Tyler's Hallwick, were full. I drove to the grave in the carriage with Governor Tyler, Mary Cowan, Elizabeth Adams, and old Mr. Addison. And finally, on March the 21st, at 2 p.m., Julia and I drove to Captain Heath's at Whitethorn and called on him and his family. We drove Morgan and Buster, we, we drove Morgan and Buster in the trap and had Miller Price along to open the gates. It was very muddy. The Heaths are very sad, but they said our coming had cheered them up some. Well, I don't know how much the Odie's going to see the Heaths cheered them up, but I can attest to the fact that they needed young Miller Price to go along and open the gates. And that is my next hook for the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, whenever Odie and his wife Julia went anywhere, whether they went in the trap, you know, the, the, the buggy, or later in the Model T Ford, Odie acquired his first car in 1914, uh, they, they took a child to open the gates. Why did they do this? Were they that lazy? Well, maybe. But there were so many gates to open. There were so many gates to open and the roads were so bad. Uh, leaving Walnut Spring to get to either Price's Fork Road or to Tom's Creek Road, the Glade Road didn't come out that far at that time. Glade Road stopped at, uh, at Tom's Creek where the town limit now is. Uh, and then Tom's, then Tom's Creek Road, or the old mountain road, meandered up through the mountain and came down about uh, where Seymour Price's store was, later Nutter's store. Anyway, in, in leaving, the, far, in leaving the, the house and going either to Price's Fork Road or to Tom's Creek Road, they had to open four or five gates. If you left the house, you had to open a gate into the front avenue, out of the avenue into the front field, out of the graveyard field into what is now Walnut Spring Road. At the end of Walnut Spring Road, you had to go through Lincoln's Gate to get to Price's Fork Road. And similarly, if you went the back way, out of the yard into the back lane and so on and so on, many gates to open. Lots of gates to open and the roads were incredibly bad. Uh, the roads were so bad because, of course, they were just dirt or mud and uh, uh, dirt or clay, I would say, dirt or clay. And in, in, in inclement weather, they were nothing but, uh, but mud. Roads around here, here weren't rocked until the 1920s. Rocking a road meant either to lay a limestone base under the road <clears throat> or to put down a primitive for form of asphalt. Price's Fork Road was rocked in 1921 and Glade Road was rocked in 1923. But before that time, certainly, uh, one ran a great risk of getting quite dirty when one uh, ventured out. When, when taking the trap or the buggy, but even more so taking the Model T. I mean, Uncle Jim's Model T, and I'm sure he wasn't alone, seemed incredibly prone to having uh, blown tires and broken axles and uh, all manner of uh, mishaps. And so, not when he took his horse and buggy or rode horseback, but when he took the car, he always wore rubber trousers to protect his better clothes, because inevitably, even if you had a child to open the gates, something was gonna happen that would cause you to get out and work on the car and, and get dirty. Well, <clears throat> the roads were bad, the gates were many, so children were taken along, either children from the family or children uh, of hired hands on the place, servant children. Some kind of children were invariably, uh, invariably taken. All this reminds me of a story that uh, Bill Moore told me two or three years ago. Bill Moore was my Preston source. I had different sources for different families, and different things of other kinds as well. <clears throat> For instance, I had uh, a gentleman named uh, Jim Cloyd down in Cartersville, Georgia. He was my Cloyd source. Uh, I had Isabel Bell in uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia. She was my Bell source. Well, I had Bill Moore in Charlottesville for, as my Preston source. I needed a Preston source because the Odies uh, not infrequently go to Smithfield and uh, mention Prestons. And so in trying to track down these Prestons, if I couldn't find them in the uh, standard reference, reference works, I would call Bill Moore. Well, Bill and I were talking about one thing and another, and, and we got on the subject of cousin marriage. And we discovered that in both his family and mine, uh, 
100 years ago or so, cousins married each other like there was no tomorrow. I mean, and I'm not talking about third and fourth cousins, I mean first cousins. And so he said, you know what, Jay? He said, that happened in the Preston family just as much as it did in yours. Bill Moore's mother was Alice Preston from Smithfield. He said, I'll tell you a, a tale about that. He said, about 10 years ago, I was at a Preston family reunion, and an old aunt there, Aunt Mary, was in her 90s then, was asked about that very thing by a young girl in the family. The young girl said, Aunt Mary, Aunt Mary, why is it in our family that so many cousins have married one another. Aunt Mary was something of a wit, I take it, without missing a beat. She said, oh, darling, she said, I think there are two reasons for that, bad roads and low fences. <laughs> well, the, the low fences is, uh, as any of you of a farming inclination know, a reference to the uh, habit of bulls getting over the fence to get to the cows sometime if the fence is too low. So I don't think the, 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 the low fences had a lot. That's, that's uh, less truth and more poetry. But the, but the bad roads is absolutely the case. I mean, it was a very small world. Or does one say it was a very big world anyway? <clears throat> Everything was very constricted. I mean, going to Roanoke was a major event. If you didn't find her or you didn't find him locally, you didn't find her or him. And uh, so those first cousins started looking pretty good. Uh, also, they were, there was no question about their family background, you know? I mean, they, <laughs> if you were socially correct, they were socially correct. Well, let me see. <clears throat> Uncle Jim got his first car, as I said, in 1914. He rode in his first car in 1911. He hitched a ride with John Henry Schultz from Christiansburg to Blacksburg in 1911. John Henry Schultz was the dining steward, you know, Schultz Hall, where some of, some of us in the English department occasionally deign to eat uh, what is pretty much inedible. But I'm sure it was better in John Henry's day. John Henry Schultz had the first car in Blacksburg. And in 1911, he drove Uncle Jim from Christiansburg to Blacksburg. And Uncle Jim said, uh, fairly a, a Twitter with the uh, uh, drama of, of this uh, revelation, only took us 48 minutes to get from Christiansburg to Blacksburg, which is a great improvement. In, in the diary in 1890, in the diary in 1890, he talks about a trip to Mountain Lake and brags about the fact that in coming home from Mountain Lake to Blacksburg, it only took him four and a half hours. Only took him four and a half hours. <clears throat> well, see, the internal combustion engine changed everything. Then you can get to Christiansburg to Blacksburg in only 48 minutes. Speaking of the invention of the internal combustion engine, um, there was something else I was going to, uh, to, to mention about those, those days. Um, during most of Odie's time, Everything was done uh, in a more rudimentary fashion. You didn't have tractors. Uh, you didn't have uh, gasoline-operated equipment. Uh, what you had was uh, things drawn by the, the horse, and you had uh, steam power often. As with thrashing, for example, during thrashing season, various individuals in the Toms Creek and Sunnyside and Price's Fork area, <clears throat> various individuals like Chap Snyder, Homer Linkus, Zach Price, and others would go around from farm to farm with crews of workers and with their thrashing machine. They had the thrashing machine, but they didn't have anything to power it with. It was just horse drawn. And then the farmers would generate steam power to run the thrashing machine. Steam power was generated by hauling water to the location where you were going to thrash, which was generally in the stackyard. Stackyard is where you had your haystacks and your wheat stacks and your <coughs> oats or rye or whatever, or ricks, whatever the case might be. But you, you brought your water there from the creek, uh, and you brought your huge boiler there, and you built a fire. Uncle Jim Odie always built a coal fire because he had coal mines, much like the Kents. You know, he was broadly diversified farming. He had everything from horses and cows and sheep and turkeys and chickens and Virginia hams to coal that he mined in his mountain land. Well, he would bring his own coal down. He invariably uh, heated the water to provide steam power with his, with his coal, but most farmers around here used wood. Anyway, uh, during, uh, during the uh, preparation of silage, you had much the same situation. Uh, silage corn, or ensilage in the parlance of Odie's day, ensilage corn was uh, grown obviously in the field where it was cut. But then it was transported to the silo location where it was cut up 
with a uh, steam-operated cutter and blown up uh, a chute with a steam-operated blower into the silo where men would have climbed up an interior ladder to pack the silage. Then some months later, when the silage was to be fed, it was sent down that same chute into wagons below to be taken to the cattle in the field or in the barn. Speaking of Odie and his coal mines, he had rigged up an ingenious way of feeding cattle in his main, in his main cattle barn. In his main cattle barn, he had laid some railroad track from his coal mines down the, down the center of the barn. He would then fill up a big railroad car with silage, and his men would push the railroad car down the center of the barn on the railroad track, scooping out silage on either side to the cattle in their mangers uh, as they went. 